John 4, verses 1 through 6 this morning. First John 4, verses 1 through 6. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God that listens to us, whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. This is God's holy, inerrant, and life-giving word. May he write its eternal truths on each of our hearts this morning. As Former missionaries, we, uh, our family has a lot of experience in airports, um, one of which is, uh, uh, stands out to me in uh, London's Heathrow Airport after spending the night uh, uh, on the floor of Heathrow Airport, um, waiting for a delayed uh, flight and hearing probably what seemed like thousands of different languages being spoken all around us. Uh, each different, uh, each uh, very, very different indeed. And I remember sitting in those sort of, you know, the, the chairs, the rows of uncomfortable chairs, the fake leather ones that sort of swing around, um, hearing a familiar voice, a, a, an English voice, an American voice, in fact. And all of a sudden, that was the only voice I could hear in this huge airport. And I remember they were, it was a, a, a young mom going over math flashcards with her child. And then an instant, amid these sort of babble like conditions, I started doing math along with them in my mind. Thankfully, it was very, very basic. Uh, math and I could follow along, but soon that's all I could hear. Two plus three equals five, and on and on. In this passage of First John this morning, uh, I think John is sending a very similar message to his congregation back in uh, these several churches that he had uh, uh, helped establish or worked alongside, at the very least. Uh, and he's asking them this very same question, whose voice are you listening to? Uh, we know from previous sermons, hopefully, if you go back to like 1 John 2.19, that there was a problem among these churches that John uh, knew very well, uh, that many from within the very congregations, had risen up and proclaimed false teaching. Uh, in uh, verse 1, he calls them false prophets, have gone out from among you into the world. And they have done untold damage both in their message, but also in their influence among those that remain in the church. And unfortunately, this is an all too common problem in churches historically and in churches today. For instance, in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 31, the Apostle Paul uh, uh, referred to, and, and Luke is quoting him here I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciplines after them. Therefore be alert, 
remembering what for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. It's all too common uh, a thing. And it's all too common a thing because uh, we're called to be discerning. Years ago, uh, Francis Schaeffer and Chuck Colson wrote a little book and entitled it, God is there or he is there and he is not silent. God is here and he is not silent. We know that God speaks to us in at least two uh, different ways. Generally, the creation all around us testifies to God's greatness and power. But if you want to know the way of salvation, you have to know that God has spoken specially in the words recorded and preserved and written down in the 66 books of the Bible. Going back to basic Christian principles, we know from Scripture that God has always had a people, that God has always had a people whom he created and loved. Adam and Eve were set apart from the rest of creation. How? Well, in a number of different ways, but one that that doesn't get talked about as much as I think it should. Adam and Eve are set apart from the rest of creation because God speaks directly to them. God didn't speak directly to dolphins or dogs or even trees and plants. In other words, God has created mankind to be revelation receivers. We have to receive his divine revelation in order to make sense of this world, in order to know salvation, and to know Jesus Christ. I mean, think about it for a minute. Some today will say, well, I can have a mystical, magical experience. I don't need to go to church. I just need to go up to the dunes and go hiking and experience God's grandeur. And sure, I sit there and I talk to him and he talks to me. Really? I mean, I would would question that, certainly. That you cannot know God in his saving work of you by forsaking the scriptures and forsaking the gathering together of the saints to worship him. But in this special revelation that he has given to us, that too has oftentimes been misrepresented, has oftentimes uh, uh, been taken out of context, uh, even back as far as, as Ezekiel, at least. I think you could probably trace it back throughout the course of human history, but Ezekiel dealt with this. In Ezekiel 13, he warned the, the people of God, Lord God, woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Your prophets have been like jackals among ruins, O Israel. You have not gone up into the breaches or built up a wall for the house of Israel that it might stand in battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen false visions and lying divinations. They say, declares the Lord, when the Lord has not sent them, and yet they expect him to fulfill their word. Have you not seen a false vision and uttered a lying divination? Whenever you have said, declares the Lord, although I have not spoken. And so in Ezekiel, we see the same problem. It's a problem of how do you know? How do you have certainty that that God's word and what we have before us has not been tainted, has not been a subject of false uh, prophets? Well, John is is aware of this thing. John knows that this is, is, is what's going on. These are the questions, these are the doubts that the people in his churches have. And so John introduces for them a very simple, what we'll call truth test. We see that here in the first three verses of this text. 
John says in verse 1, test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Uh, so, so he's aware of it. He knows these false prophets. And then he goes on to give us what this test is. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. You see, the truth test is, is quite simple. Ask them about Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ, and nothing short of statements that Jesus is fully man and fully God will do. First of all, uh, Jesus as fully God, we're told, and we saw back in John 2, 22, a few weeks ago, that uh, Christ is not Jesus' last name. But it's a title that he bears. That he is God the Father's anointed one. He has been called out. He has been set apart and given the word to do as Savior of this world. Jesus' title as Messiah reveals to us his divine nature. And shows us that he has done what only God can do which is to work out your salvation for you. We can take it even a step further. That God has done in his word for us what only God can do in revealing himself to us. In April 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first man in outer space. This Russian cosmonaut uh, reflecting the uh, uh, world around him in communist Russia came down and in an interview said very boldly and arrogantly, see, we've been to outer space and God is not there. C.S. Lewis uh, just wrote a very quick uh, sort of quip in response to that and I think very well said, he said, uh, Hamlet cannot find Shakespeare by going up into the rafters of the theater and looking for him there. The only way that Hamlet can find him is if Shakespeare writes himself into the play. And that's exactly what God has done. In his son, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, he has written him into the script. He has written him into human history for us to see he has revealed to us Jesus Christ. And so anyone that confesses Jesus as Messiah, Jesus as divine, speaks the truth. But you know also that, that you must know that Jesus is also 100% fully human as well. The Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 8 Section 2 speaks of Jesus as conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and then this interesting phrase, of her substance. I want to quote for you at length a uh, theologian named Donald McLeod. Uh, I think this is a fascinating, it's a little bit long, the quote, but sort of gets down to the heart of, of, of what understanding Jesus taking on human flesh means. He says, this underlines the fact that in all essential respects, Christ's human body was identical with our own. It had the same anatomy, the same physiology, the same biochemistry, the same central nervous system, and the same basic genetic code. But the derivation from the substance of the Virgin Mary also means that she, as mother, contributed to him all that any human mother contributes to her child, sin accepted. Through the umbilical cord, he is this particular man, the son of this particular woman, the bearer of the whole previous genetic history of her people, and the recipient of innumerable hereditary features. He was a unique genotype precisely because she contributed at least half his chromosomes as any human mother would. 
How the rest were contributed remains a mystery. The one certainty is that Mary could not herself have contributed the sex-determining chromosome Y, which is always provided by the biological father. This chromosome, at least, must have been provided miraculously, and it remains possible that all the chromosomes normally derived from the male parent were provided in this way. The divine act which fertilized the ovum, simultaneously creating the 23 chromosomes complementary to those from the mother. You see how detailed that is? I mean, if you know human life and the creation of human life, you stand in awe of it. This is taking it to another level, though. That Jesus takes on human flesh. Jesus takes on human chromosomes, if you will. That he was fully God and yet fully man. And John goes on to explain to us why this is, why both are absolutely necessary. In verses 4 and 5, he says, little children... You are from God and have overcome those enemies, those false teachers, those claiming that Jesus was not fully God and fully man. And he goes on to say this, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That he is in you. In other words, that you belong to Jesus Christ. He dwells within you. You belong to Jesus and Jesus belongs to you. And that's who you are now. That's your identity, Christian. You are in Christ. R.C. Sproul puts it like this. He says, when we speak of the incarnation, we are speaking of an event that took place in time. At a particular point in history, God the Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, took on a human nature without subtracting from himself any of his divine attributes. In him, the whole fullness of deity is pleased to dwell, and this will be so for all eternity. Notice how he explains why. Yet while the incarnation took place in time, it has its foundation in eternity past in what we call the covenant of redemption. That commitment by the members of the Godhead to one another to send the Son to bear the divine wrath in order to effect reconciliation in the Spirit between the Father and His elect people. You see what he's saying there? Why did Jesus have to take on human flesh so that he might live under God's law and fulfill it perfectly to attain perfect righteousness for you and I? But he takes it even a step further so that in human flesh, he might bear the wrath of God upon himself so that he might die in his human flesh. All so that you and I might be spared the wrath of God and given the righteousness of Christ. That's what salvation is. It's to claim a righteousness that is not your own. It's the righteousness of Christ that we have. And to proclaim that Jesus took my wrath for my sin, or his, God's wrath for my sin upon himself. And that's why he says here that, that we are victorious, that we have overcome. And, and taking it all the way back to uh, eternity past, this means that we have always been victorious and that we always will be victorious in Jesus Christ. More than conquerors are we. So remember that, Christian. On your bad days as well as your good, when your children are behaving badly, poorly, that greater is he that is in you than he that is within the world. When you have a fight with your wife, you are still victorious in Christ Jesus. When your boss comes down hard on you at work, 
when pressures mount and arise all around you, when your investments perform poorly, when you're at odds with someone in your church, you are victorious in Christ and you always will be. And he points you then and gives us a, 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 a great taste of what it is to be victorious, to be like Jesus Christ, to be seeking reconciliation, to be uh, loving the way that he calls us to love. And then he gives us even more specific direction, I think, here in, in verse 6. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. First of all, that discernment is a corporate endeavor. Notice in verse 6, he does not use the first person singular, but rather it's third person plural. It's we. It's us. It's the church. Holiness and the pursuit of truth is a corporate church-wide event. It's something that you and I have been called to do together. That we are united to Christ, but we are united to one another. And therefore, our pursuit of truth, our discernment of falsehood from the truth is always a corporate endeavor. And we need greater corporate discernment in the church today. Secondly, we see that our understanding of Jesus Christ is woven intricately with our understanding of the church as well. The church is called, in part, to be a defender of this most vital and important teachings, that of who Jesus is and what he has done for our salvation. John Calvin wrote a long time ago, the heretics in olden times departed from the faith in one case by denying the divine nature of Christ, and in another case by denying his human nature. People who confess Christ to be God and man are still departing from the faith if they do not adhere to the confession that the apostle requires because they rob Christ of his own merit, where free will, merits of works, fictitious modes of worship, satisfactions, and the advocacy of saints are set up, how very little remains for Christ. The call even to our corporate worship, what we do here on Sunday mornings, that Christ is to be front and center, that he should be at the center of every service and every sermon, that it all would point to him, but not just him as we conceive him to be in our own minds, but Christ as he is revealed to us in the pages of scripture. And that brings us to our third and final point of application here. The main problem that John is addressing here to his congregation is that some refuse to listen to the word of God and he even uh, uh, specifies the word of God as brought about, as testified to uh, by the apostles. It's an important point as well. Whoever knows God listens to us. We speak the truth, uh, he's saying, that, that the apostles have affirmed it. John is speaking not in his own power of his own accord, but as the Holy Spirit has revealed it to him. In uh, John's Gospel, if you go back earlier, he depicts the work of the Holy Spirit as 
uh, the spirit of truth. In John 14, 17, speaks of the Holy Spirit as uh, one who bears witness about Jesus' death. John, therefore, felt that it was necessary to hold together the Word and the Spirit. Or in other words, he felt that it was necessary to stress the Spirit's role as witness to the truth of the Gospel concerning Jesus Christ as it was proclaimed from the very beginning. Many churches have fallen and failed in this regard. Many movements today have moved beyond the Word to the Spirit. And you see this all the time. You see this all around us. That if it's effective, if it's meaningful, if it says or does something for you, well, that must be evidence that the Holy Spirit is at work and working, and we must not be too judgmental, to uh, rule that out of line. But you see John's warning here. You see why these churches are struggling right now. It's because these spirits that he talks about in verses 1 and 2 have not pointed back to God's revealed word. And you see it all the time today, the temptation to be fascinated by that which is new, by that which is innovative, by that which is cool and hip and effective. All kinds of bizarre forms of worship and uh, praise and prayer and uh, uh, bizarre displays of uh, acting and, and what have you on stage on Sunday morning. The Spirit of God works together through His Word and testifies to our hearts that this is how God has revealed it to be. And therefore, brothers and sisters, we have to have ears to listen to what the Spirit points us to and uh, into God's Word. I would ask you this morning to ask yourself this very simple question. Whose voice are you listening to today? Let's pray together. Father, give us clear uh, ears to hear your word and to know your Holy Spirit living in us. We pray that Christ would be central to our lives, to our church's life, to our worship, to all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In closing hymn, you'll find in your red Trinity hymnals, hymn number 345, Glorious Things.